you know, it, it, it's a very good point, a uh, very valid point. And um, um, I, I can say that I've been involved in both sides of that issue throughout my career. And it's just, I mean, too much information is better than that. Um, yeah, a large distribution, I agree. Um, let's see, the first thing about the Attorney General policy, okay, is that a regular thing where the uh, something in other facets of the uh, other industries, a letter would be sent to the AG for, a, uh, for anything? Well, not necessarily, but it, you know, this kind of place, more or less litigation, if you disagree with the policy that you eventually get, the policy statement from the division, then people file a 106 appeal in the district court or declaratory judgment request and say, we disagree and we want a judge to, to resolve this controversy that exists in the uh, determination of, of the ruling question. I'm just worried about, is there any, by sending it to the AG, does that impede, can that come down from somebody who's against the, the industry to say, okay, we're going to start this process because uh, of whatever the political situation or whatever is ha whatever is happening, and I'm maybe too paranoid, but I'm just asking the question yeah. from the point of view of do we need another layer on yeah. top of this? Maybe let me explain just really the practicality. Bob, you can chime in because I know you and I have been involved with this process for years. But um, the reality of the situation is is when a formal request for a position statement is tendered, um, I would be a fool if I didn't go to my AG and ask for, for guidance. Now, I don't always agree with what my AG says. I go on record to say that. All right, Kelly, but um, it is what it is. And that's why this process is placed, because when I issue the formal position statement, your next step formally is to go to my office, uh, the State Licensing Authority. The State Licensing Authority is going to do the same protocol. They, too, have counsel independent of my counsel. Uh, and they will seek their opinion and decide accordingly what they want to do with the issue. Um, it's a good process to vet out these issues before it goes to court. It saves a lot of time, it saves a lot of money um, on behalf of everybody. Uh, I've had issues candidly over the years where um, you know, I took a position on something, and the next thing I know, a lawsuit was filed in federal court. Um, I can tell you that one right off the top of my head where that happened. Um, there was no communication after. I was, I was absolutely amazed that, that they went down that road. Uh, fortunately, the federal judge dismissed that lawsuit, um, verbatim, uh, after almost verbatim what our position was um, the following day, but it's additional expense, it's additional time and energy, and the process really works, um, and it, does, it doesn't happen without the AG's involvement. Okay, that's good. The second thing that I had, thank you, the second thing I had is, if you look under C number two, a ruling on a petition will not terminate the contract. That's just under the grounds when something is not going to be issued. A ruling on the petition will not terminate the controversy nor remove uncertainties concerning the applicability, blah, 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 blah. The question becomes, if we ask the question, all right, and we're trying to, we're trying to figure out what the situation is, the determination to say under that is, she seems to me somewhat vague. In, in, in the sense of where are we going to next in, in answering the question, or how is that meant to be? Right. Uh, and, and I'll tell you how the process works. Oftentimes, uh, there's a statute that drives an answer, and the statute itself may not be clear, and ultimately it circles around to rulemaking. Uh, the response may be that we don't have the ability to render a position based on the statute, but it's something that we would entertain through rulemaking on our next regularly scheduled meeting. Uh, that process happens as well. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and that's really the only situation I can do. So that's the usual res response of saying, we don't know what to say, but we're going to... No, no. Um, or not the usual, but I'm saying in a situation where you may be faced with that situation, it's not going to just be totally left out no, no. In, the, in the box. Right. That's all. And I would have to say that this rule, I think, is very beneficial to the industry as a whole because it does uh, remove uncertainty when you get an answer. It gives you a quick answer because there are time limitations. You can spend a year or two in court and never get anywhere and spend a whole lot more money. So this is an expeditious and efficient way. Oh, I agree with you. Yeah, I'm not the, fighting that at all. I'm no, just, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand that thoroughly. Thank you. Yeah, it's one of those things where if the division itself fails to answer, you have the ability to go directly to the state licensing authority. Um, and then from there, if they don't respond, I just have a couple questions. Um, 
can this be used to clarify when there is no rule? Can this be used if there is no rule and you're seeking guidance, if the rule itself is unclear at any stage in the process, and then what authority does a position have as far as um, if anything in here is unlawful and you're seeking clarity and revenue issues in your position and we don't necessarily agree with it, is that the law until it goes further? Or how, I mean, just the process was. Well, and the division may take a position or a position that's contrary to, to what you believe. You then have the ability to appeal and, and seek a declaratory order. They will issue, I mean, stays can be granted, the legal process can intervene. Uh, it doesn't become law until the issue is resolved. I don't know. And I don't know that I want to use the term law. It's not the, the Well, yeah, that's term. a question. Operations-wise, once you issue your position, we have to operate under the guidance of that position until the process fully plays out? Well, if you appeal it, obviously it's not in place until the state licensing authority issues this order. If they issue a final agency at that point, meaning that is the official position, your next step then is to go to district court, and you would have to give a stay or, or something pending <coughs> the litigation. Norm, um, so this is, in essence, an advisory opinion of, of sorts. So we're, we're, the licensee is asking for a clarification of the rule, and they get, uh, as spelled out here in 2, 3, and 4, they get a, an opportunity to put forward their evidence and put forward their scientific basis. Understood. My question is, tell me a little bit about the trier of fact. It's, is it you? Is it Dan? And who is the individual that actually, or the group of individuals, to come down with a decision. Who are they? You're, you're asking for a statement of position on behalf of the Medical Marijuana Enforcement Division. That would come from, as a matter of law, the appointing authority, the person responsible for that division. Um, and that would be subject to appeal to the state licensing authority, who is the executive director of the Department of Revenue. Or it's designated to be the deputy director. Um, from there, it would go directly to district court. So it's the Met. Pardon me? It's the Met. Well, the, the statement of position is on behalf of the man. Right. The man is not the state licensing. Sure. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Sir. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm definitely all for avoiding litigation, believe it or not. Jewish holiday. You're on camera with that being said. says uh, for a statement of position concerning the applicability to the petitioner yeah. should should say that which then leads me to the point of you know these positions are only as applicable to the person who's petitioning I mean they're not general rules of law which kind of relates to Jill's comment these are not like cases that can be cited as legal binding legal precedent to the general industry, it's only the applicability to the petitioner. You're, you're absolutely right, but from my perspective, the regulatory perspective, it's, it's unreasonable for me to expect something of one person in this industry rather than the industry as a whole. And the way that we, we make it the industry as a whole is through that rule making process. Okay. Yeah. And then a couple other just minor points sure. on the C. Um, you've got the 30 day deadline at the top, which is good, and then on, in C, and then on the next page, uh, D, it just says promptly. I think we should put, you know, deadlines, actual dates, what we mean. Because promptly to the government means a little different than promptly to those of us in the private sector, maybe. Oh, yeah, we will pay. Maybe 30 days, seven days. I, you know, I think as quickly as possible, though. Especially if they're not going to entertain it, they should make that decision quickly. I thought there was something in there. I might be missing it. I just I see the, the 30 days in there a couple times, but then I see the state licensing authority just being subject to the <coughs> promptly. So maybe we should clarify that. And there's three and days in C1. That's for the for the uh, enforcement division, and then the Department of Revenue. I don't think is subject to any... It's a good point, Rob. Uh, last deadline. Yeah. And then 